Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, it's our third colloquium today, and in today's colloquium, we're gonna go. We're gonna focus on the charge transfer processes and ion adsorption at the solid liquid interfaces. So that those a good understanding of this phenomenon generally is absolutely crucial for the design and, and characterization of all types of electrochemical energy storage systems, both on the electrode material and electrolyte sides. And in today's colloquium, we're hosting Patrice Simon, who is a professor at the University Paul Sabatier, is, is one of the best experts in electrochemical supercapacitors and solid liquid interfaces. Um, and as you probably know, supercapacitors rely on the, in general, reversible electrosorption processes, and such processes can be extraordinarily complex. So as you probably have seen in the previous colloquiums, and so today we will continue to dive even further into the electrochemical adsorption, double layer, solid liquid interfaces, and so on. So Patrice, stage is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Henry. Andrew. So um, thanks a lot for being there. This is my great pleasure to, uh, uh, to give this, uh, this lecture today. And as uh, Andrew mentioned, I'm going to talk about electrochemistry at nanoscale and trying to uh, give you a picture about ion adsorption transfer in, uh, in electrodes. So basically, the outline will be as follows. I will start by an introduction and context. I will uh, spend uh, the first part of the talk uh, will be dedicated, I will say, onto the uh, electrochemical double layer. And then I will move to uh, uh, redox materials. And I will finish by, by conclusions and uh, perspective. And, um, I discuss with Andrew and we, we will make a, a break of 10-15 uh, uh, minutes between the two parts so that uh, there will be a, a bit time for questions. So uh, the context is about energy storage, electrochemical energy storage. I guess that you are more or less familiar with this kind of plot which gives a specific power versus specific energy of, uh, uh, of uh, several uh, uh, energy storage devices. You have here batteries here, which are more or less marathoners. Lithium ion batteries, the most popular one, they have high energy density, but low power uh, density. And the time constant ranges from uh, tens of minutes to several hours. And then on the other uh, side of the, of the uh, diagram, you have, oops, sorry, you have I would say uh, supercapacitors, electrochemical capacitors. So these are quite high power devices and medium energy density, so 10 times less than uh, batteries, I would say. So the time constant for these uh, uh, supercaps ranges from a few seconds to one or several minutes. And the key message is that supercaps and batteries are complementary devices. So what are, uh, I will say, if we uh, have a look from the uh, capacitive storage uh, perspective, the, the goal here is to increase the energy density, still keeping the high power performance to reach here more or less uh, the star that you see here. And I will say that the main challenge for supercaps is to understand the ion transfer adsorption in confined nano-sized pores of porous carbons. Then if you have a look from the battery point of view, uh, one of the main, one of the important, not main, but important challenge for batteries is to increase the power density because obviously there is a big development today for solid, all solid state batteries for long range autonomy for electric vehicles. But also remember that you have lithium, you have uh, lead acid batteries in, uh, in cars and for hybrid vehicles, high power batteries will be uh, very important. There is a super big market for these batteries that obviously high energy density battery will not uh, meet. So today in, uh, in battery materials, we are working, uh, operating through uh, redox reactions in the bulk of the materials. And the challenge here is to design materials with non-diffusion limited redox reactions so that you can increase the power of these devices, materials. So let's start by the double layer, the first part of the talk. Uh, capacitive storage, double layer, and so on. So the electrical, the electrical double layer at planar metallic electrodes, the first most uh, simple view is the Helmholtz model. So the Helmholtz model shows that, uh, propose a, a, a screening of a charge by the first layer of counter ion adsorption on the electrolyte at the approaching distance D, and uh, the double layer capacitance is then the Helmholtz capacitance. There is a linear potential drop within 
the Helmholtz layer, and the Helmholtz capacitance is proportional to the electrolyte dielectric constant, uh, the surface array of your electrode, divided by the approaching distance of the first layer, this Helmholtz layer, the Helmholtz layer of ions, which are stuck onto the electrode. Uh, however, there are some uh, concerns with this model. The first is that if you use a, a diluted electrolyte, the first surface layer cannot balance the charge on the surface of the electrode. And the second is that counter ion layers are not static because of uh, ion movement, thermal agitation. So that <clears throat> we move to then to the, I will say, the, the Guy Chapman. Uh, model and the Guy-Chapman model considers that you have a diffuse layer. So the thickness of a, the length of a screening, uh, the distance from a screening for the charge screening uh, is uh, uh, longer. It's uh, the, the charge is screened by uh, through the Debye length. And this Debye length is uh, reversely proportional to the concentration, C0. And this capacitance of a diffuse layer uh, uh, as an hyperbolic uh, behavior, it changes as cosinus, hyperbolic cosinus of the potential. And then, if you represent the change of the uh, Guy Chapman capacitance versus the potential, you can see that you have an hyperbolic uh, shape. But this hyperbolic shape, the first point is that this hyperbolic shape disappears at high concentration. If you use highly concentrated electrolyte, you lose this kind of hyperbolic shape. And the second point is that the experimental capacitance you can measure are always much uh, lower than the predicted capacitance. This is simple, uh, simply due to uh, the point that we shot my model uh, proposed to use uh, point charges for ions so that these ions can get uh, they can approach unlimitedly close to the electrode surface, and then you can reach to super high capacitance from the model, which is obviously not correct. So this is why to solve these two issues, uh, the stern layer, I mean, the stern model was used, and this, the modification of uh, what, what the stern model brings is to uh, include a kind of inner Helmholtz plan. So this plan of ions will avoid the, uh, to consider that ions can get as close as possible, uh, unlimitless, uh, close to the electrode surface. So now with this kind of uh, uh, stern uh, model, uh, the capacitance one divided by C is one divided by the, I will say inner Helmholtz layer plus one divided by uh, the Guy Chapman uh, uh, capacitance. And you end up with this equation here. So that you solve the issue of the infinite capacitance uh, uh, with, with the potential. But um, I would say when you use, uh, depending on the, on the application of your, uh, of your electrodes, if you use highly concentrated electrolyte, then the Debye length is zero because you have no more diffuse layers. So that it's really interesting because it simplifies the equation and you can cancel one divided by, uh, I mean, the the Guy Chapman part, and then the double layer is more or less simply the inner part of the stern layer, which is can be approximately equal to the Helmholtz capacitance. So this is uh, what we have. What we saw was is valid for conventional electrolyte when you have salt plus solvent. However, there are some uh, additional electrolyte over. Uh, alternative electrolytes, which are very interesting for several applications, which are solvent-free electrolytes, ionic liquids, which are liquids at room temperature. So when you don't have any uh, in ionic liquids, obviously, there is no solvent molecule. So there is no charge screening by the solvent molecules uh, of uh, between the ions. So uh, your Guy Chapman model needs to be modified because you need to, to take into account when you move from solvent plus salt electrolyte to ionic liquid electrolyte, you need to take into account the ion packing fraction, which is a capacity of your ionic liquid, which is much higher for ionic liquids uh, compared to conventional salt plus solvent electrolyte. And you need to take into account the ion correlation length, which is just in fact the electrostatic interactions that can that exist between anions and cations in solvent-free ionic liquids. So basically for ionic liquid, delta C, which is the uh, 
uh, uh, dimensionless uh, correlation number uh, is higher than one, and uh, gamma, which is an ion packing fraction, is higher than 0.1. So in ionic liquids, how the uh, capacitance, double layer capacitance, changes with, with distance of electrode. Here, this is uh, the change of the density uh, of the ions to the surface of the electrode from the surface of the electrode moving to the bulk of the electrolyte. And what you see, I'm going to focus on two, these two, uh, uh, the situation where you use, uh, which is similar for ionic liquid. So high packing, ion packing fraction, gamma is 0.5, and high dimensionless ion correlation length. So in that case, this is typically the case for ionic liquids. What you see is that you have here a first layer of ions, and then here the charge, the density, the charge of the electrode is the inverse of the charge of the first layer. This is explained by, by what is called the charge over screening. In fact, in ionic liquid electrolyte, we inject, when you inject, for instance, negative, negative charges on, into your electrode, then the first layer of counter ion, cation, over screens the charge. You see here, you have, there are six positive charges, only four negative charges, four electrons onto the uh, metal surface. And then this overscreening effect means that behind you have another layer of co-ion, counter-ion, which is co-ion to the charge, and, and so on. So this is why, this explains you why you have this negative charge excursion here when you increase the distance from the surface. This is typically here, what you, what you see here is this layer because of a charge over screening. And charge over screening is important because it increases the Debye length, it increases more or less the screening distance from the electrode to uh, the bulk of the electrolyte, and then it decreases the capacitance. And if you apply <clears throat> even more potential, you move from the charge over screening effect to what is called the charge crowding effect. Here you can see that you have this uh, two layers of counter ions because you, you, you force more and more the adsorption. And then you have two layers of counter ions on the electrode surface. And this is typically what is shown here. You see for high uh, correlation length, high delta C, you have this plateau here, which corresponds to uh, a zone of the electrolyte, this one, where the charge of the electrode is exactly the same. And then this is a crowding effect and this is the overscreening effect. And as you can see, for small low ion correlation length here, there is no crowding, no overscreening. So this is the main difference between ionic liquid electrolyte and conventional electrolyte. And then how does it change the capacitance, diffuse capacitance versus potential? How it modify the gouy chapman model? The gouy chapman model, the Stern model, I would say, the conventional one is this one because what you see is for a uh, low uh, ion uh, fra um, packing fraction, low ion fraction number, and low uh, correlation length, here, what you have is the conventional Wishapman model. But then when you increase gamma and delta, when you move from conventional electrolyte to ionic liquid solvent-free electrolyte here, you see that you move from a camel shape with two bumps, two maxima, here for the intermediate situation between, I would say, conventional sol plus solvent and neat ionic liquid to a bell shape here where you have only a capacitance decrease from the PCC uh, when you increase the potential. And this is the work from uh, uh, Alexei Kornichev at Imperial College and also uh, Michael Bazant at MIT. And this means what? This means that the message is that when you use ionic liquids, uh, you have an overscreening, a crowding effect, and you have an increase of the Debye length to screen the charge into the, into the electrolyte. And then this decreases the, uh, I would say, the capacitance, the diffuse uh, layer capacitance. This is the main message of these models. But keep in mind that in ionic liquid, because of the ion correlation and the packing density, then you have a different behavior uh, compared to conventional. So now let's move to, I would say, uh, this application, 
ion adsorption for energy storage application. So in capacitive, uh, I would say uh, for capacitive storage, you use high surface area porous carbon uh, materials. And what you are going to do is you have two electrodes here and a uh, negative positive electrode. You polarize your electrodes. Electrodes are super high porous carbon, high surface area carbon. And you are just going to store the charge by, I would say, charging the double layer. And you see you have a sketch here where you have the uh, electrolyte and the two porous carbon electrodes, which are represented here. And inside these porous carbon electrodes, you are going to absorb uh, the ions to store uh, the charge by charging the electrical double layer at both electrodes. So what is interesting is that differently from the situation where you have a planar electrode, there are a lot of different things which are going to happen uh, in these confined poles where the pore size is in the, within the nanometer range. And this confinement effect has a huge impact onto the double layer, I would say, charging. So what you, do, what you do at the lab is you do a conventional electrochemical characterization. You assemble cells, uh, you assemble, you take carbon powder, you make uh, films, electrodes with binder, and you assemble cells with separator. Your first uh, one, one, one electrode, uh, one film for negative electrode, another film for positive electrode. And then you can do cyclic voltammetry, for instance. And uh, as long as you use a constant uh, uh, potential scan rate, uh, if your double layer capacity is constant, then you have constant current. And this is a, what we call the conventional capacitive electrochemical signature, uh, because again, there is no redox reaction in capacitive storage. You stop the charge before reaching the electrode, the decomposition, the reactions linked with decomposition of the electrode. Okay. So, uh, so this is a long time ago work we did with uh, Professor Yuri Gogotsi, who is in the audience uh, from Drexel University, a famous uh, material scientist. Uh, who's, you, you will hear a lot about his work uh, in this talk. And we did, uh, uh, we use model materials, porous carbon model materials that we prepared from a chlorination of, uh, uh, I would say, titanium carbide, because when you do that, you can remove the titanium through gas phase, TLCl4, and you end up with a carbon, which is porous, what is super interesting is that you can tune the porosity of your carbon depending on the chlorination temperature. I don't want to go too much into details of the, of the, of the synthesis, but uh, this is a porous volume versus pore size. And what, if you tune the chlorination temperature, you can prepare samples, porous carbons with, I would say, uh, not really unimodal pore size, but with a very nicely tuned and controlled pore size and pore size distribution. So we use this, uh, this, uh, I would say this, uh, these materials a uh, long time ago, 15 years ago, to study the ion adsorption in, uh, in uh, carbon pores. And what we found at that time is that here, this is a normalized capacitance versus the average pore size. And when you, uh, when you use non-aqueous electrolyte, tetraethylammonium, tetraferroborate electrolyte in uh, acetonitrile solvent, when you go to, when you use carbon with a pore size, which is less than the solvated ion size, which is the size of the ions in your electrolyte. So when the pores of the carbon are smaller than the solvated ion size, uh, you increase dramatically the capacitance. So you can, first the message is that you can absorb, you can charge a double layer in pores, which are smaller than the size of the solvated ions. You can increase, when you do that, you increase the capacitance. And obviously the, what we proposed at that time was that carbon nanopores with one nanometer size and below were accessible thanks of a partial desolvation, distortion of the solvation shell. And the first thing to do at that time, uh, since, since that time was, it was just an hypothesis, try to understand and to try to give experimental evidence of this desolvation. Uh, because it was not that trivial. And uh, <clears throat> so you need to design, I would say, to think about advanced tools to understand this ion adsorption in nanopores. And one tool that you can, that you can use, and there's a wonderful work from Michael Levy on this uh, domain is electrochemical quartz crystal microbalance. By using electrochemical quartz crystal microbalance, what you can do is that, you, what you do is that you measure dynamically the change of electrode during the electrochemical polarization. 
basically you take a piezoelectric quartz, you coat with uh, your porous carbon, and you use this quartz as working electrode. And if you are in the right, uh, if you carefully uh, select your uh, uh, parameters, you can use the Sohabra equation, uh, which gives you that, which make a relationship between the change of the resonance frequency of the quartz, because this quartz is a, is, a, is a piezo quartz with a resonance frequency. And when you polarize your uh, electrochemical quartz in your, uh, in your electrolyte, as long as you have a weight change during the polarization, Onto into your porous carbon, the frequency, the resonance frequency is going to change. And you can co make a correlation between the change of the resonance frequency and the weight change of your quartz, of your material, through the Sohabra equation. And what is interesting is that if you plot the change of the weight of your electrode versus the charge, then this is a Faraday's law, and you can go back to the molar weight of a species, which absorb into your porous carbon. If you take a one nanometer pore size porous carbon and you take, I will say an electrolyte, which is a, a cation of uh, composed with EMI, it's ethyl methyl metazodium cation and trifluoromethane sulfonide imide anion, EMI TFSI and acetonitrile, two mole per liter. Then if you recall the cyclic voltammetries, current versus uh, potential, then what you see is that uh, you have this kind of uh, capacitive here, signature. It's a double layer charge, there's no redox reaction. And here, what you see is that uh, uh, you have a change of the frequency here during the polarization. So you explore here from below the OCV, the negative uh, part of your uh, voltammogram means that normally you play with cation adsorption. And if you explore the uh, potential range positively to the OCV, you play with anion absorption desorption, and you see you have capacitive like signature and also still a weight change. So you can, what you can do is you can integrate uh, the cyclic voltammetry and get the charge and plot uh, the weight change for the solar equation versus the charge. What you see is that you have this, uh, experimental linear plots, which is uh, like that. And these are the Faraday's, uh, Faraday's law, which uh, in fact means that if you consider on negative charge, you consider that one electron you inject into a carbon is balanced by the adsorption of one EMI plus needs, which is one 11 gram per mole. On the positive charge, you consider that one hole you inject into your carbon electrode is balanced by the adsorption of one TFSI minus 218 gram per mole slope. So what you see, you have here an experimental weight during negative polarization, which is larger than the theoretical, means that EMI plus cation enters with solvent molecules. And then the difference between experimental plot and theoretical Faraday's law gives you the number of acetonitride molecules. And here you see that you can adsorb EMI plus cation into the nanoporous carbon with 3.6 solvent molecules. And in bulk electrolyte, EMI plus is solvated with eight acetonitride molecules. So this is an evidence of desolvation, partial desolvation of cations to enter the pores. And here on the positive side, what you see is that you have a weight, which experimental weight, which is less than the theoretical one. This is simply explained by what we call the ionic exchange mechanism, where a positive charge into the carbon is balanced by adsorption of anion and desorption of cation. In fact, two positive charge means one anion in, one cation out. So this is uh, this highlights highlight a change of. I would say a charge storage mechanism. First, we, we see desolvation, partial desolvation on the on negative side, and then we see also a change in the uh, charge storage mechanism. And this was also further confirmed by uh, the group of uh, Volker Presser in, in Germany, uh, who used SACS, small angle X-ray scattering uh, measurements with three different carbons. 1.3, 0.9, 0.65 nanometer pores in aqueous electrolyte, uh, cesium chloride. They define 
a degree of confinement here. The degree of confinement is you, you count the number of carbon around your ion. It's like if, if the ion is solvated by the carbon, pose carbon. And what they found is that the more the degree of confinement and the more you can store here for negative polarization charges. But this, the amount of charge you can store in this carbon is really important when you go to small porous carbon with porous carbon with small pore size. So it means that here for the CDC, which has the smallest pore size, you can see that all the points here in black are obtained. The charge is stored in a highly confined uh, pores, means that in, in very small pores where the ion is solvated, I would say, by the carbon. So this is uh, uh, also, you can see it like that on a, on, in another way. This is a degree of confinement and the charge versus the charge of the, the charge versus the degree of confinement. And you can see that the more you have confinement, the more you have a cap an increase in capacitance. So the capacitance increase in confined pores uh, thanks to the partial dissolvation of the ions. And then when you move to a conventional ionic liquid to conventional, I would say, solvent plus salt to solvent-free electrolyte, what happens? Uh, if you use solvent-free electrolyte, you, you, there is no more, I would say, solvent molecules. So here, you see, you play with, you can play with the real size of the ions, 0 0.76, 0 0.79 Amsterdam. And if you do more or less the same similar experiment, what you end up with is, you see here, you have maximum capacitance here when the size, the pore size is about 0 0.7 nanometer. It means that the maximum capacitance is rich when the ion size is close to the pore size. So this is really interesting because it shows that now when you fit more or less the pore size uh, fit with the ion size, you sharply increase the capacitance. And to try to understand uh, why there, there were some uh, experiments done uh, still with uh, uh, X-ray scattering. So three carbons were taken, two carbons three were taken, a one nanometer per size carbon and 0.7 nanometer per size. They were filled with bulk EMI TFSI, no, I would say, uh, uh, solvent. So just to, how to do that, you immerse in uh, solvated uh, solvent plus uh, salt uh, EMI TFSI dissolved acetonitrile, and then you remove the acetonitrile, you wash the carbon, and you have post carbons which are filled with neat EMI TFSI. And then they did, uh, they did uh, some, uh, I would say, uh, uh, X-ray scattering measurements, some corrections, and some uh, modeling, and they end up with the electron radial distribution function, ERDF. Uh, these are the ERDF functions for the bulk EMI TFSI, and the EMI TFSI con uh, confined in one nanometer per size carbon and 0.7 nanometer per size carbon. So this is the electron density, and this is here the distance from here one anion. So you take one anion in a pore, and then you, uh, you check the electron density from this anion. And the first maximum that you can see in bulk liquid, when, when there is no confinement, this is a bulk EMI TFSI, the first neighbor here is at about 0.9 nanometer. When you confine this ionic liquid in the pore of one nanometer pore size, you see that still <clears throat> you have the first neighbor at 0.8 nanometer, but obviously the second neighbor is less pronounced because of the confinement. And when you confine in small pores, 0.7 nanometer, what you see here is that you have no more second neighbor, but you see that here you have an increase of a density, electron density at low, I will say distance, 0.5 nanometer. What does it mean? It means that you are going to have an anion, which is going to be super close to the first anion. So you break more or less the Coulombic ordering because you can create, you can get two anions closer here when they are confined in small poles compared to the situation in bulk liquid where these two anions are uh, at a distance of 0.9 nanometer. So this is a breaking of a Coulombic ordering. It means that when you count the number of anions around one anion, you have, when confined in 0.7 nanometer poles, you have 25% of the first neighbors, which are co-ion anions. And 
it means that you can create co-ion pairs when you confine these ions of an ionic liquid in the pores of a porous carbon. And this is interesting because this echoes the super ionic state theory that Alex, uh, Alexei Kornichev proposed in uh, 2011 uh, in double layer capacitor. He considered a pore with a small size and he put ions of the same size of a pore. And here he found that the Helmholtz capacitance, which is the, the, the inner stern capacitance, when the ion size is more or less the same as the pore size, was three times higher than uh, the conventional one. And this super high capacitance was explained by the creation of ion co-ion pairs. You could put these co-ion pairs inside. You can fill with the pores with co-ion pairs and you could put more ions because you could approach two ions of the same charge at a closer distance. Obviously, after, uh, after a given distance, this differential capacitance fall down because you, you have saturated the poles with all the ions. And this is exactly what, uh, what was uh, shown by Futamu Arial in this paper in 2017 from the experimental point of view, the creation of co-ion pairs thanks to the creation of image charges onto the carbon surface. What is interesting is that this is even enhanced under polarization. Under polarization, for instance, when you polarize your electrode at minus two volt, you force cations to enter. You see that around one cation, you have more or less 42% of cation as of in the first solvation shell. So you even further enhance the Coulombic breaking, ordering breaking, and you enhance the capacitance. So this now, uh, a lot of things needs to be understood, and particularly the effect of the confinement on the solvent uh, when you use a solvent plus any liquid. And then I will move to uh, another point because it's uh, very interesting to try to understand what happens in nanoporous carbon. But to a certain extent, it's sometimes interesting also to, to make a step back to try to, uh, uh, to understand, to use model materials like graphene to try to understand the basic interactions between ions and graphene, between electrolyte and graphene, to better understand then further what happens in 3D porous carbon. So we did here at the lab uh, EQCM measurement onto a single layer graphene. It's a single layer graphene grown on, uh, on, on copper, and then you transfer onto a quartz, and then same, you use it as a, as a working electrode. So this is a, a view of a quartz coated with a single graphene layer with an uncovered gold zone because you have some holes onto the graphene. It's a, it's a p dubbed graphene. Uh, you have some wrinkles, uh, uh, but uh, never mind. This is a, this is a, this is a, a the quartz is a nicely coated with a, with a graphene with a single layer graphene, and this is the cyclic voltammetry of uh, first the bare gold in black, and then in red, the cyclic voltammetry of a single graphene, single layer graphene. So you, as you can see, the electrochemical signature was slightly modified, but it was expected because you just coat with one layer of graphene or quartz. And then we did some uh, differential capacitance measurement. To do that, you use electrochemical impedance spectroscopy at different potentials, and then you uh, measure uh, the capacitance. And you plot the capacitance change versus the potential. And what you see is that we have a V-shaped capacitance, what you call the butterfly shape, with a PZC potential of zero charge, where the capacitance, differential capacitance, is minimal. And this equals some papers using carbon nanotubes, single wall carbon nanotubes, where they reported also this uh, uh, minimum of capacitance. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the reference does not appear, so uh, I apologize for that. Uh, this is a work from uh, Coates, and also the work from uh, from Zhu, uh, which uh, describe in fact the uh, interfacial capacitance between the single layer and the electrolyte by the effect of a quantum capacitance. In fact, the message is that uh, this is shape capacitance, butterfly shape. Uh, can be due or to the limitation from the carbon side, from the single layer graphene, the quantum capacitance of the graphene, can be due to the electrical, electrical conductivity of carbon, like was mentioned by, by Rediger Kurtz, but it can be due also to maybe interactions, strong interactions between the electrolytes and uh, the single layer graphene. So to try to understand 
where does this PZC and V shape come from? We did here uh, EQCM uh, in gravimetric mode in EMI TFSI, still the same electrolyte, neat EMI TFSI, and this is the this is the I would say the change of the frequency, and we went back to a change of weight versus Q. What you see is that starting from PZC, for positive polarization, you have a constant weight loss, 338 gram per mole. So it means that you desorb a positive polarization, a positive cluster uh, with a net charge of one. And this kind of cluster can exist in neat ionic liquid because, again, of the absence of uh, charge screening by the solvent molecules. So it seems that during positive polarization, you remove from the, from the surface of the electrode a big cation. But then here for negative polarization, you see there is no weight change. But still, we see on the CV a capacitive charge storage, still double layer is formed. So what we believe happened here in this situation and was confirmed by modeling is that this charge storage mechanism at zero delta M occurs just thanks to electrolyte reorganization onto the surface of the graphene during negative polarization and not only electrolyte, but maybe more specifically the cation orientation, EMI plus orientation with a ring, which is going to orientate parallel to the surface when you increase the negative polarization to better screen the charge. And this is very interesting because it's an, a demonstration of a charge storage by just electrolyte reorganization, thanks to a strong interactions between EMI plus cation and single layer graphene. But then this was interesting, and uh, to try to go a little bit further, we uh, try to understand the role of a solvent. So we put acetonitrile, we put back acetonitrile into an ionic liquid, and we use a similar single layer graphene. And we did electrochemical characterization of single layer graphene using EQCM in EMI TFSI solvated in acetonitrile. And this is the change of differential capacitance versus the potential for the bare gold. So obviously for the bare gold, the double layer capacitance is flat and constant. For here, the neat EMI TFSI that we saw before, and now the solvated EMI TFSI in acetonitrile. What you see first is that you have a shift of a PZC moving from solvated to neat EMI TFSI, a shift of a PZC to negative side. So this really shows that when you put solvent, you screen the interactions between the EMI plus cation and the single layer graphene. You decrease the interactions between the ring of the cation and the graphene. Then we try to use a much shot key analysis uh, of this single layer graphene ionic liquid interface. The interfacial capacitance can be then considered as a space charge capacitance in series with double layer capacitance. And the space charge capacitance, this is the much of key analysis, is given by the difference of the flat bond potential and potential and this equation. And the, this is the uh, charge carrier density. If you take the derivative of this, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this equation, then you end up with this expression. Obviously, double layer capacitance is constant with potential. So for the goal, this is what you saw for the goal. So, and you can plot one divided by C square versus the potential corrected from the PCC value. And you see here first that you have a change of the conductivity mechanism from N type to P type, uh, whatever the electrolyte. And what is interesting is that you have also a change of slopes. And this means what? This means that this interface capacitance depends on both the single layer graphene and the electrolyte as you can see from the slope difference. And what is this kind of space charge capacitance that you can define? Because if you define a space charge capacitance, you need that you, it means that you can define a volume. And this volume could be more or less the Graham-like model where you can consider that EMI plus cation have strong interaction with graphene surface in neat ionic liquid, and they are specifically absorbed onto the graphene surface, like in the Gram model. And then you can define this space charge capacitance by taking into account the first layer of specifically adsorbed ions. And 
then what you can you can try to compare what uh, the, the two plots uh, need EMI TVSI and surveyed EMI TVSI. The charge care density that you can calculate from the slopes is 10 to the power three to 23 uh, per, per cubic centimeter uh, charge, uh, charge carrier, which is a really, uh, I would say, uh, which is really good because in fact, if you consider a one nanometer uh, for the Dubai length, you end up with uh, 10 to the power 14 per square centimeter, which is very conventional uh, to values previously, previously reported for single layer graphene. It needs EMI TFSI. Then, when you survey the EMI TFSI, you end up with more or less similar slopes, so similar doping level, uh, so charge carrier uh, density level uh, between the two electrolytes on the positive side. However, what you see on the negative side here, there is a big change of slopes, and it means that in surveyed the EMI TFSI, you increase the charge carrier density ND to 10 to the power 23. 24 uh, per uh, uh, charge ca uh, carrier per cubic centimeter. And this, we believe, can be explained by a decrease of the Dubai length because in solvated EMI TVSI, there is no more over screening or slightly less, or sorry, only uh, slight uh, over screening. And then if you decrease the Dubai length, you increase the charge carrier density. So the message here is that. The interfacial capacitance is driven by the space charge capacitance, but this space charge capacitance is not only the quantum capacitance of a single graphene layer. It's a mix between the surface of the graphene and the ions which are in strong inter in direct interactions with the graphene. And this is very important to understand that because it means that not only the graphene, not only the quantum capacitance, but the electrolyte also has a strong impact. And finally, what you can see is that if you use your QCM in gravimetric mode, then you can, <clears throat> in uh, EMI TFSI solvated, you have this V-shaped plot, means that you, have, you play with counter ion adsorption on both sides of a PCC. So it means that here you can absorb EMI plus with, with more or less one solvent molecule, and you can absorb TFSI minus with more or less two solvent molecules. Remember, neat EMI TFSI, the shape was completely different, and the big change, the main change between these two is that here in EMI TFSI, you have a huge pi pi interactions between the cation and the graphene. Here, you screen the charge between the graphene and the cation. So this charge screening is really leads to super important change in this charge storage mechanism for the double layer. And more, remember the 3D porous carbon we saw before, this was the shape of a gravimetric plot between in a, in a CDC carbon in the same electrolyte, solvated EMI TFSI. This is here now with EMI TFSI two mol per liter in acetonide oil with only the single layer graphene. And you see that there is no more ion exchange mechanism for the graphene layer. So it means that this is very important. Not only the pore size, but also the carbon local structure is very important for the capacitance. And then finally, I would say just that uh, all these results, they, they lead to, uh, uh, for since 2005, where the super cap uh, result from the community of, of a scientist, uh, uh, the super, we talk a lot about battery performance improvement, but super caps, they double the energy density for the last 15 years, which is already something very important. And uh, 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 the applications of super caps uh, really regarding breaking energy recovery and, and, and so on for transportation are, are now uh, really booming. And this is uh, with this, I would like to end up uh, to end the first part of the lecture. So I was a bit long, sorry about what, 40 minutes. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, I would be glad to take some questions. Uh, Andrew, if you, if this is the plan. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Patrice. This is really, really great talk. Um, so um, I just wanted to say, um, first of all, that this is the first part of the talk, so please, um, stay and and uh, you know uh, watch the second part because it's it's really important to know that we the first part of the talk is usually more of a more or less introductory and then the second one is also um, uh, quite related to research. So at this point um, we're open to questions. Um, so the audience can ask. I unmuted everyone. So go ahead. 
or maybe I can start then. Sure. Um, so uh, in the beginning, so when you discuss the carbon, the porous carbon, one thing that was has been quite interesting to me for a long time, a bit confusing, um, is that no one's really proving that this porous carbon is um, properly conducting electronically across all the pores because there are a lot of random broken bones and types of carbon-carbon bones appearing, right? So how do we know what really, what fraction really works and to what extent? Yeah, um, this, is a, this is a very interesting, uh, this is a very interesting point and you, you, you're right. So, but it depends conducting versus what? Because, you know, uh, if you, when, when you use electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, you realize that most of the uh, resistive part is the ionic, is given by the ionic uh, resistance of the electrolyte. So it means that the uh, uh, electronic conductivity of a carbon is, I would say, uh, high enough to do uh, what we what we want to do. Um, there are some also some uh, some uh, experiment that we did uh, using uh, uh, porous carbon filled with EMI TFSI uh, ionic liquids only in liquid uh, aqueous electrolyte, and what you can see is that you have no power limitation. Uh, you, you, you can increase largely the, the, the power because you have hydrophobic EMI TFSI ionic liquid in the pores of the carbon and immersed in hydrophilic electrolyte and this does not change the power. So to get, a, to get an answer, a, a, a practical answer is so far the limitation, if there is, obviously there is still a limitation, but is not really important uh, for our experiment. But uh, I will show in my, my second talk that uh, second part that when you use muxine materials with a very high conductivity, obviously for lithium intercalation and so on, it, it, it plays a role. Uh, but uh, so far, there is there are only it's it's uh, very difficult from the experimental point of view to uh, to have an idea about this uh, potential distribution within the electrode, the porous 3D electrode, and. So far, the models, uh, molecular dynamics or even DFT, they, 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 uh, they have some difficulty to take into account the change of local graphitic, uh, graphitic uh, uh, character of, uh, of a carbon. And this is what, we, what, we, uh, what I show in the last part with a single layer graphene. You see that uh, when I say that the in specific interactions between the EMI cation and the sp2 carbon of the graphene are really important because you change uh, you change the charge storage mechanism, you change the adsorption mechanism, countering adsorption. This is in fact also related to the local conductivity of the carbon through the sp2 carbon. I'm not sure I was clear. <laughs> no, yes, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty clear. But, but, but difficult to, uh, yeah, but, but finally, this is super difficult to have a clear answer to your question from the experimental point of view. Modeling uh, obviously will, uh, will, will be of great help. Uh -huh. Okay, and maybe you can also comment. So some questions come in, in the chat um, on the correlation of the porous carbon area, the electrochemical areas, some people call it, and the actual surface area. Because obviously, when you have, again, so many broken bones and such a high, I wouldn't say atomic porosity, how do you define the actual area? Yeah, this is also a very interesting question that we did. Uh, we did a couple of papers on that. Uh, there was a paper in Nature Energy in 2016 uh, where you can find a lot of information. It depends, obviously, of the size of a probe you consider. It's super difficult to uh, 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 to give an absolute value of a surface area because, again, the size of a probe defines by itself the surface area. So what is important is the electrochemical accessible surface area. And there are ways to, uh, to measure it, to, to have an idea about it. When you measure the uh, accessible surface, when you, when you have your, uh, your ion size, neat ion size, for instance, you take, uh, I don't know, uh, a cation and an ion with a neat size of given. Then what you can do is that you, you can play with your uh, surface area distribution you, with, uh, with a porous volume versus a pore size, and you can uh, remove from your calculation, the surface area, which is not accessible because surface area, which corresponds to porosity below the size of your neat ion. And then you can replot more or less your uh, specific capacitance in microfarad per square centimeter versus, uh, versus the size of the ions. And you can, uh, you can, uh, you can recorrelate 
these two measurements, this was done with Volker Presser and Yuri Gotsi in, uh, in a paper in 2016. Um, ju just to, to tell you that, yes, it's super difficult to have an absolute idea of the surface area, but you can make some correlations like that and you can uh, really reproduce the increase of capacitance at low pore size uh when you uh, when you uh, when you use uh, when you do correct measurements and by correct measurement i mean that you need to use argon not nitrogen because you have some uh, quadripole uh, coupling with nitrogen and you you, you used to uh, to you you must use a, a dft model nonlinear dft uh, uh, 2d models not obviously the BET equation which is nonsense for microproduced carbons and once you take all these all these questions again you can remove the surface area, which is below the size of your uh, uh, neat ion, uh, neat uh, uh, anion cation, and then you you can you can make some correlations. But finally, what is important is accessible electrochemical surface area. This is why giving some uh, uh, microfarad per square centimeter is a bit tricky. It's better to give gravimetric capacitance or volumetric capacitance. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe also a related question to this. So. Um, when we speak about these nanopores or even sub nanopores, at some point, um, of course, we can't really say that there is a double layer, right? So there is some sort of intercalation of, of molecules. So maybe you can comment on that. And maybe is it, is it correct to say that we're basically forming a thermodynamically different phase when we just put molecules in those pores? Yeah, I will uh, go. I mean, in the second part of the talk, I will uh, comment on that, but uh, what, what I show regarding the uh, ionic liquids confined in a super narrow pores of 4.7 nanometer, showing this kind of uh, uh, super ionic state is obviously something that you cannot uh, a kind of, uh, these coion pairs at 0.5 nanometer distance cannot be created in bulk electrolytes. So yes, in a way, when you confine these uh, neat ionic liquids in 0.7 nanometer pores, you create new state of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of your electrolyte by this uh, coion pairs. And when you have ions in solvent electrolytes, in a solvated with solvent, sorry, and molecules that goes into uh, super narrow pores, then you can, you may have some partial charge transfer between your carbon and your ion. And this, I will, uh, I will show you example in the second part of the talk. Uh, okay, so well, we have a lot of questions in the chat, but I saw someone raise the hand, maybe um, someone can directly ask a question. Um, yes, uh, I have a question, if I may. Thank you very much, Patrice. Uh, first uh, it was a really really interesting my question is directed to the shift that we have in between the pure ionic uh, liquid and the mixture with acetonitrile in terms of pcc uh yes in in terms of yeah, these shifts uh, yeah. and my question is the following if we mix sure the ionic liquid with some solvent additional to the um, ion screening that we will have, we can as well have uh, a change in the ionicity of the ionic liquid, isn't it? That we may induce ion pair formation and this at the end may modify the activity of the ions. Would this uh, as well, could be correlated with this shift? Yeah, I think that here, to my, this could be an option, but to my opinion, the main, uh, the main difference again is uh, this is what you clearly see uh, with uh, with uh, uh, the PCC measurement. Uh, in fact, when you have this sp2 carbon uh, and you have this uh, this ring uh, EMI ring uh, in neat ionic liquid, you can uh, let's go back there. Okay, you remember this uh, this uh, constant weight change during negative polarization, but still capacitive uh, charge. So it means that this is a reorientation of the ions. And the only ions which are involved in negative polarization are EMI plus cation. So by this measurement, what we saw is that this cation can reorientate, and this was confirmed by modeling, can reorient, for instance, here they are, they have, uh, in this situation at low negative charge, they are perpendicular to the electrode surface, to the graphene layer surface. And then if you inject more and more charges negative, then it can go parallel to the electrode surface so that we increase, in fact, 
uh, the charge and then you can balance the, the screen the charge. So this is the first part of the experiment. So this gave you gave us a kind of an idea uh, saying that there is a strong interaction between the EMI cation and the single layer graphene. And then when we did this, uh, yeah, these measurements, when you see that when you put solvent, you increase the PCC, it means that you have less cation which are strongly adsorbed onto the surface of your single layer graphene when you put solvent more. And this is why we, we, uh, we are we are, I would say, uh, not 100% sure, but uh, we are pretty uh, confident that this shift of a PCC is mainly due to a, diff to a screening of an interaction between the cation and the graphene, graphene layer. Strong interaction between cation and graphene layer means, I would say, positive charges onto the graphene layer surface, so that you need to go to negative potential to screen the charge and reach the PCC. You add solvent, you decrease the interactions between the graphene and the cation, and then you shift your PCC to positive. So if we did not do the gravimetric measurement in, in a neat ionic liquid, I would say that, yes, this could be a possibility. But these measurements done, gravimetrically speaking, with EQCM in neat ionic liquid uh, tend to show that it's more of a strong interaction that you tune between the EMI cation and the graphene that you tune when you uh, add solvent. Thank you very much. Uh, Patrice, uh, maybe we can, uh, I, I will ask one last question just based on what, what I see in the chat and in YouTube, um, and then we can continue. Okay. We have too many questions, unfortunately, I cannot go over all of them. Um, basically, the question that I think is really interesting is how do the um, defects in the graphene um, play the role in the capacitance? And maybe I can just extend it a bit into the other question which is related to the size of the ion on the ionic liquid molecules. So I can imagine that, for example, in the um, porous carbon, you have lots of sites where those molecules can bind directly, right? Can, uh, can just can absorb or uh, electrosorb. So um, how do you really know that this is a double layer and not um, uh, a pseudocapacitance, for example? What, what is the role of defects in those cases? Is there any way to differentiate it? Uh, if you play with, uh, if you uh, if you use uh, aqueous electrolytes, I will say that yes, you may you may have some uh, 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 pseudo redox, some pseudo capacitive uh, uh, pseudo capacitive effect in your porous carbons on these defects, and especially when you dope with nitrogen. However, here we um, I will say we we use non aqueous electrolyte. This is why it's a bit more complicated to uh, to make this polarization in non aqueous electrolyte. But the, the advantage is that you have you are less much less sensitive to this kind of pseudo capacitive effect from I would say uh, uh, surface groups of uh, whatever or whatever you want. So this is the first answer. I think that the defects the main effect of defect in non aqueous electrolyte in carbons is uh, more or less what you see here in the, in the slide. Um, when you have a graphitic, I would say a super nicely ordered structure of single layer graphene, you see this V shape for the massogram plot means that you play only with counter ion adsorption on both positive and negative side. However, when you are in 3D porous carbon containing a lot of defects, then you see that you have this charge uh, this change in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, adsorption behavior which is the i would say ion exchange mechanism at positive charge that you don't see here and the main difference between the two carbons again is the difference in uh, is a structural difference because you decrease the interactions uh, from from uh, from the from uh, between the between the ions and the single layer graphene because you don't have this kind of graphitic uh, rings onto the carbon rings in in your porous carbon. So the, this is why I think that the defect here in the three D porous carbons in non aqueous electrolyte are much more related to a change in interactions and then leading to a change in adsorption mechanism rather than creating a kind of pseudo capacitance effect. But to now answer your question, uh, it's quite complicated because in aqueous electrolyte, we can see some bumps, redox bumps, when you, uh, when you polarize some carbon uh, in aqueous electrolyte. So you can say, okay, maybe there is something, then you can try to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to design some electrochemical techniques to study this pseudo effect. I would see that, so that in, uh, uh, show that in my next talk. But 
uh, when you don't see such bumps or stuff like that, I think it's very difficult to try to uh, to, to 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 make this, to distinguish between a, um, double layer and absolute capacitive because uh, uh, if you don't have any any beginning of something onto your CV or, or your uh, your impedance uh, spectroscopy, it's super difficult. But my my main answer will be. The main effect should be again the difference in ion uh, transfer, ion adsorption, moving from counter ion adsorption to ion exchange mechanism when you increase the effect of force carbons in non aqueous electrolyte. All right. Thank you so much. Maybe we can proceed then to the next part. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So uh, the second part uh, is uh, dedicated to, I would say, uh, the redox materials, batteries. Um, uh, I will see that <clears throat> again, the, sorry, I need to put it full screen. Sorry about that. Yeah. So the idea is to try to improve uh, energy density, uh, power density of batteries. So first, very uh, basically, the difference between a double layer signature, electrochemical signature, battery faradic uh, signature is here. You can see when you play with an ion, a cation adsorption in porous carbons, for instance, what you see is that you end up with a rectangular voltammogram because, and obviously the current here is proportional to the potential scan rate, changes with the scan rate because of the uh, C is, uh, 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 capacitance is the current divided by dV over dt. And there is no diffusion limitation. It's a surface process. So it's low capacity, high power. When you move to redox materials, and one of the very nice example is a two-phase redox material, LFP. So lithium intercalation in FAPO4, which proceeds through a two-phase uh, uh, mechanism. You have Li FAPO4, FAPO4. So each time you intercalate lithium in FAPO4 and you form Li FAPO4 and you decrease the content of FAPO4. You have very nice peak on your voltammogram. And these peaks are diffusion limited. Obviously, this is a Randall's basic equation. And the peak current here changes with the square root of the scan rate. And the message is that this is a bulk process. In the bulk of the material, the lithium intercalation is limited by diffusion. And then you can nicely distinguish between these two behaviors, first by the CV, but also by the analysis of a change of current, I would say, versus the scan rate, square root and the scan rate here. If you uh, want to, to see the galvanostatic uh, charge discharge plot, this is also a big, big difference between double layer signature, which is constant uh, decrease of a potential during discharge uh, at constant current with time. And here for uh, LFP material, battery uh, material uh, limited by diffusion, you have a two phase uh, redox material. You have this plateau, voltage plateau here at uh, 3.4 volt for, for LFP during charge and discharge. Okay, this is clear. And now uh, I will say that <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to try to understand, to go back to the basics. Um, so this is, I don't see my screen. Anyway, this is not a big deal. So to try to go back to the basics, first, uh, the, the, the notion of adsorption to low capacitance was defined for the uh, electrosorption of cations, for instance, onto a metal here. You have metal, you, you negatively polarize, and you have electrosorption of cation. If you define theta as a surface coverage, the concentration of cation with electrolyte Ca, then the Langmuir type electrosorption process on the 2D surface is given by theta divided by 1 minus theta uh, is a KCA exponential. The Vf divided by T is uh, Arrhenius law, I would say, simple. Then you can extract the potential. It's like a Nernst equation with theta, again, theta being uh, theta being the surface coverage. And you can calculate from, the, from this equation uh, differential capacitance, Q d theta of a dV, which is the adsorption pseudo capacitance, which is, in fact, proportional to theta multiplied by 1 minus theta. And C phi is the adsorption pseudo capacitance for a single monolayer of uh, cation onto the metal surface. However, this gives you a, a very uh, a sharp peak, change of a capacitance with potential. And there is a second, sorry, there is a second kind of uh, uh, model you can use, which is a Frumkin, Frumkin sorry, type electrosorption model. So you just here in this equation, you just add 
a lateral interaction parameter J. J is what? J takes into account the interactions between the two cations onto the metal surface. And then when J is zero, when you play with Langmuir electrosorption model, here, this is the change here of the pseudo capacitance with a potential. You can see that you have a, a, a maximum capacitance at a given potential. However, when you take into account this lateral interaction parameter, J, G, sorry, G, when G is positive means when you have repulsions between two cations, when these interactions force the cations to, uh, to go away from each other, then you can spread more the capacitance versus potential, okay? The adsorption capacitance, pseudo capacitance is less potential dependent. And then Brian Conway in, uh, I think in 1993, started with 1990, sorry, he, he generalized this approach to 3D materials. And this is an example of TIS2. This is a paper from Conway. Lithium intercalation in TIS2 from non aqueous electrolyte. And you can see this is the potential versus X, X being the number of lithium intercalating in TIS2. And theta in the previous equation here, the surface coverage is replaced by X, X being the number of lithium intercalated in TIS2 or the number of Faraday exchange per TIS2. And then you end up with this expression of a potential, E or V is E0 or V0 plus Hx, RT divided by F log X divided by one minus six. And you can see that H is the lateral interaction parameter we saw before. And Conway added this intercalation pressure, which corresponds to a pressure of intercalated cation inside the structure. But thanks to this equation, he was able to translate, I would say, this electrochemical behavior of lithium intercalation in TIS2 into a kind of pseudo-capacitive behavior from the adsorption pseudo-capacitance, uh, I mean, sorry, from, the from a kind of derivative of the adsorption pseudo-capacitance we saw before. Then came ruthenium oxide, and ruthenium oxide in sulfuric acid, elect sulfuric acid electrolyte is a material that can change if is redox oxidation state from two to three to four through, uh, I will say, a proton intercalation. And you can intercalate proton into your ruthenium oxide and you have this kind of rectangular shaped cyclic voltammetry, which is pseudo capacitive. And in that case, you see this capacitance is more or less constant. But this capac constant capacitance cannot be obtained only with a single J lateral interaction parameter. However, you can consider now that you, you overlap different processes, different, I would say, pseudo-capacitive adsorption uh, processes occurring at different potential. And the succession of these different various, uh, I would say, uh, redox processes, I would say pseudo-capacitance pseudo adsorption processes, and it gives you a kind of constant, more or less, capacitance. And this is the pseudo capacitance of ruthenium oxide. And then what are the key features for this pseudo capacitive behavior? It's a more or less constant change of Q versus V. No phase change because you play with log of X divided by one minus X. No diffusion limitation, obviously, because there is no sharp redox X. And <clears throat> now you see that we have a double layer capacitance we saw before. And now this kind of surface redox pseudo capacitance because this proton intercalation in ruthenium oxide occurs via hydrous hydrated zones of a ruthenium oxide and it's a surface confined process and again they share similar electrochemical features and all these three points ends with a mirror like image of the cyclic voltammetries okay then then came muxines and uh, as i mentioned before yuri gogotsi uh, pioneered the muxines in 2011. what are muxines you are these are some uh, uh, i will say uh, metal carbide uh, uh, metal carbide which are prepared from uh, uh, max phase max these are for instance m is the early transition metal a is uh, valve metal aluminum oops, sorry. 
al sorry, aluminum, for instance, and <clears throat> Cx is carbon and nitrogen. And you have the example of C, uh, C, uh, X element here. So you start from, oops, you start from, sorry, uh, I don't know what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you start from Ti3 ALC2, so layers of Ti3C2 and aluminum in between. You etch from fluorine containing aqueous electrolyte, lithium fluoride in HCl. And then you can remove completely the aluminum layer and you end up with Ti3C2 muxines, materials, which are 2D materials, but you have some surface groups <coughs> onto the surface, sorry. <coughs> you have surface group onto the surface and surface groups are mainly fluorine, OH- and oxygen groups, okay? And what we show with uh, uh, Maria Lukatskaya <coughs> was that these materials, muxine materials, TL3C2S, for instance, in sulfuric acid electrolyte, they can end up very super fast proton intercalation behavior, a super fast proton intercalation playing with titanium-3, titanium-2 <coughs> redox material. And then you end up with a pseudo capacitive behavior. With here, you see <coughs> a redox peak, uh, which is a pseudo capacitive redox peak. Uh, here you have a super, uh, super fast uh, cyclic voltammetry, and you can see still that you have a mirror-like CV. And the capacitance you can get is uh, super high, 1500 square for, for per cubic centimeter. And you can see that you can go down up to uh, one volt per second with very nicely, uh, very nice capacity retention. Same for capacitance inference program. So in summary, you have high gravimetric and volumetric capacitance, and you can have very high capacity retention beyond one volt per second. So these materials <clears throat> are high power materials, very high capacitance compared to carbon. And the problem is that in aqueous electrolyte, you are limited to one volt, and then it's a strong limitation of these materials, mixing materials in aqueous electrolyte, but again, it's a pseudo capacitive like phenomenon, storage mechanism. And this is a second kind of redox pseudocapacitance, surface redox pseudocapacitance. You can see that since we have these mixing layers, which are uh, flexible between them because they have a, a bound by where we have Van der Waals forces, uh, then you can, <clears throat> you can play with very fast proton intercalation reaction onto the surface of the mixing. And this is a surface redox capacitance. Then came uh, niobium oxide. Niobium oxide in uh, PC electrolytes, non aqueous electrolytes, you can still for lithium intercalation. And this is the work from uh, Professor Bruce Dunn's group and uh, Veronica Augustine a few years ago. Uh, if you have a look to the intercalation of lithium in niobium oxide, then you see that the cyclic voltammetry between one volt and two volt, I would say, looks like really <clears throat> capacitive. It's a pseudo capacitive signature. You have a fast lithium intercalation and you can reach high capacity. However, what was very interesting is that, sorry, is that if you have a look to the X ray diffraction during cycling, so this is you take the cell, you cycle, this is the uh, reduction, intercalation of lithium, oxidation, the intercalation of lithium. This is the potential, this is time. And we did some XRD we recorded in situ XRD pattern during the cycling. What you see is that you have no phase change. You have only during lithium intercalation, you have expansion. Lithium day intercalation, you have contraction. And <clears throat> what is very interesting is that it shows that this process is not only on the surface of the material, but it's in the bulk of the particle. So this is why it was defined, proposed the, the concept of intercalation, pseudo capacitance with this nb 5 mechanism. And if you have a look to change the capacity with a C rate, so you can see that <clears throat> if you discharge a material at in, I would say uh, 36 seconds, or let's say 3.6 seconds, which is one, uh, 1000 C, then you can still recover 50 milliampere per gram. It's a super fast, high rate lithium intercalation material. Obviously, uh, this is very interesting for, for to, to boost the power of, uh, of uh, lithium-ion uh, uh, batteries, but niobium is, uh, is a material which cannot be uh, really uh, used. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a costly material and so on, but this, what is more interesting is the concept. 
The concept shows that, yes, you can really end up with a super fast lithium ion intercalation in non echo selectoli. And then this is what we call the intercalation, pseudo capacitance, in the bulk of a material differently from the surface. And then <clears throat> we, I talk, uh, I, I talked about muxine uh, uh, before. These muxines, which were prepared from aqueous electrolyte and fluorine containing electrolyte for etching aluminum. Uh, another way was another route was proposed to prepare this muxine, but free of fluorine. Means that if you prepare muxines from etching from fluorine containing aqueous electrolyte, you end up with a surface which contains fluorine groups. The idea was to prepare muxines without fluorine groups. And to do that, you prepare, you use molten salt synthesis. You take copper chloride, which is soluble, at, which is liquid, sorry, at 750 degrees C. And you put your max phase, TI3CIC2. And then you're going to reduce copper to plus and oxidize the silicon. And you prefer, you prepare your TI3C2. But you reduce copper to plus into copper. And so you need to, to wash, in fact, your TI3C2 material with an oxidant to dissolve the copper after uh, etching. And this is an image of uh, the TI3C2. So it's a lamella uh, material. XRD pattern shows that you start from max phase and then you, you end up with a 00L, uh, I will say, uh, 00, zero uh, diffraction peaks, and you have exfoliation of your material. And analysis show that you we prepare TI3, C2 more or less, oxygen and chlorine muxine, no fluorine content of muxine. And what was the main change? The main change was the shape, electrochemical signature. When there is no, no fluorine and no OH minus onto the surface of a muxine, then you could end up in non aqueous electrolyte, in electrolyte of lithium ion battery. LIPF6 in the CDMC, you can end up to with a very nice electrochemical signature with no peaks, mirror like CV, is pseudo capacitive like, and very high, I mean, very high, quite high capacity. Uh, you can end up with 200 milliampere per gram at one C rate. And when you increase the C rate up to, for instance, a 60 C at a bit more than 60 C, you still can get more than one, <clears throat> sorry, you still can get 100 milliampere per gram. So this is a pseudo capacitive like signature, mirror like CV, high capacity, 0.3 electron per titanium atom, and high power performance. And this is another kind of intercalation pseudo capacitive material, <clears throat> which can be uh, listed in this, uh, in this panel, which is a muxine in uh, ECDMC. Now, what about the electrochemical characterization of these pseudo capacitive materials? <clears throat> so, as I mentioned before, uh, battery materials, they, are, uh, they store the charge by bulk redox process, so they are diffusion limited. And obviously, the peak <clears throat> follows the uh, Handel's basic equation. And then you have the peak, which is proportional to the square root of the potential scan rate. And for a pseudo capacitive material, it's a non-diffusion limited process, can be redox or uh, a redox process, sorry, which is non-diffusion uh, limited. So the current changes with the scan rate. And then Bruce Dunn's group <clears throat> proposed a method where you can deconvolute the total current at each potential between, and you can, uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can tell that, you can say that the current is a, is a sum of two different contributions, surface and bulk non-diffusion limited, diffusion limited, which is changes with scan rate and square root of a scan rate. And by doing that, <clears throat> you can really, uh, I will say, if you take the example of a, a, a lithium intercalation in, uh, in uh, TIO2, you can play for each potential, you can calculate K1, K2, and then you can deconvolute your uh, materials and you can say, yeah, this is a, you can try to, uh, to, to you can try to, uh, distinguish between the capacitive, which is a uh, surface-like process, non-diffusion limited, and diffusion limited process. But <clears throat> what is interesting with this method is the possibility to again distinguish between the two, two points, but you need to, uh, to you, 
still to understand what you do. For instance, if you take lithium ion phosphate, which is a typical battery material in a micro cavity electrode to decrease viomic drops, then you do scan rates. Micro cavity electrode, you use super small amount of materials so you can reach super high scan rate because no omic drop. And then <clears throat> if you use this, uh, uh, I will say a deconvolution uh, of, of a current between non-diffusion limited capacitive lab, pseudo capacitive like and diffusion limited uh, Faradic battery like uh, processes. Uh, this is this equation, IP divided by square root of the scan rate is K multiplied by uh, square root of V plus K2. And at, you, can, uh, you can calculate K1 and K2 for uh, depending on the potential scan rate. And you end up with this, uh, I would say this diagram and where you see three different zones. Here in zone one, in this zone, uh, K1 is 90 times higher than K2. It means that in this first zone, K1 is super high compared to K2. So capacitive current, I would say surface current, will be is much larger than diffusion limited current. Does it mean that LFP is capacitive? No, not at all. It simply means that you are using so low potential scan rate that you are you, 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 the time is much larger than the diffusion time. And then you can have access to all the capacity of all the grain. This is why the current changes with the potential scan rate and not with the square root of the scan rate. So the first message is that when you do this kind of deconvolution, the potential scan rate range you use is super important. And keep in mind that you must still understand what you are doing. Otherwise you can say really uh, things will surprising and strange things. And the second point is that here is a change of a, a peak position for oxidation and reduction. And here, you have here the change of the peak position with the, the logarithm of the potential scan rate. And again, here in this zone between 1 to 5, uh, 0 0.1 to 5 uh, millivolt per second, which corresponds to this zone here, you see that you have a slope of 60 millivolt per alpha n per decade. So this means that from uh, the electrochemical kinetics point of view, you have a quasi reversible system. And this is the reason why you still, everything is connected, why you have a kind of capacitive like non-diffusion limited uh, material. But again, this is simply because the potential scan rate is very low. And then when you go to super high scan rate, you see that your, uh, your peak separation uh, changes of to 300 millivolt per decade for V higher than 50 millivolt per second. Okay. And another other methods to try to uh, uh, distinguish between, uh, to, I mean, to characterize the pseudo capacitive materials is the uh, potential intermittent transition techniques methods, PITT, step potential methods. One is uh, uh, MUSCA, multiple uh, uh, step uh, potential uh, chrono amperometry. So the point is, this is a cell where you put muxine electrode and you scan, you want to make a uh, kinetic study. If you do uh, your kinetic study, you uh, you increase potential scan rate from two to 100, 200 millivolt per second. However, the series that you see here, there is a big shift decrease of a peak here. And this peak decrease might be due to or kinetics or omic drop. So that to try to get a CV at high potential scan rate a clean from omic drop. The first point is to try to use cavity microelectrode, but it's very tricky and you don't have any idea about the weight you put inside. And the second point is to try to minimize the effect of the omic drop. And to do that, you can, for instance, use a step potential methods. You, um, in fact, you are going to scan between uh, the potential range by potential steps. For instance, here, uh, you have an example where you use a potential step of 100 millivolt. So you apply 100 millivolt and you record the change of the current with time. And then you move to 0.1 to 0.2 volt for one in one shot and you record the change of the current with time. And then what you do for each step, you have a change of the current with time and you can calculate, integrate the charge passed during the constant potential step of delta T. And depending on delta T, the delta T you select here is more or less two seconds, 100 millivolt potential step, integration time of two seconds, 
So it means that your potential scan rate is 200 millivolt. And little by little, you can recalculate back the cyclic voltammetry from your multiple step experiments by integrating the current, calculating into the average current, and then you can replot, replot. This is a calculated cyclic voltammetry with after this MUSCA method, which again allows you, since you are using 3D electrodes, to minimize the ohmic drop in your materials. And you have a better idea of the electrochemical kinetics without, uh, not without ohmic drop, it's not true, but by mi minimizing the effect of ohmic drop. And then you can play, play is the, is the right word, you can play with a K1, K2, a method of uh, Bruce Dunn uh, by, uh, and you can uh, uh, recalculate the capacitive, uh, which is non diffusion limited, so capacitive, non diffusion limited, and diffusion limited capacity uh, contribution of occurrence. And there is other PITT methods which are which can be uh, used. And uh, one is uh, called the SPEC from uh, Professor Scott Dunn, also, which is very interesting because it can also, uh, you can, thanks to the SPEC method and a lot of equations, you can model back and calculate back if the, the diffusive current, transient current, double layer current at each potential. It's a bit more complex. Then you can use electrochemical impedance spectroscopy to make a characterization of your pseudo capacity material. And you have here, an example of three different materials, double layer Nyquist plot, double layer uh, pseudo-capacitive material and battery material with verbal limitation. Here, to uh, describe this Nyquist plot for porous carbon electrode, for instance, double layer, you simply need what we call the, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, cotangent uh, uh, impedance, what we call the, it's a restrictive diffusion uh, impedance model. It's more or less the Delevy model, which is transmission line model. This is the equivalent of a Delevy model. And this cotangent uh, uh, impedance, which again means that you are in a restrictive diffusion behavior, uh, nicely uh, nicely uh, fits more or less the, this, uh, this kind of behavior. When you, move to, when you move to battery with Varbure-like, obviously use Varbure equation, the charge transfer, double layer capacitance, and your Varbure uh, Varbure impedance, and it's a diffusion limited process, semi infinite. And you have a charge transfer resistance again, double layer capacitance. And for a pseudo capacitive material, you have this charge transfer resistance here, and also this uh, restrictive diffusion behavior. Watch because the charge, sorry, the RT charge transfer resistance might be very low, and you may don't see this charge transfer resistance in pseudo capacitive experiment. Uh, material. So this is why uh, when you, you can really make, uh, uh, it's sometimes difficult to, to distinguish between double layer and pseudo capacitive materials. And uh, there is a, a work from uh, Jeff Long who used uh, this electrochemical impedance spectroscopy to study two uh, the same material in, uh, I mean, one material based on manganese oxide in different electrolytes. So it's uh, carbon nanofiber coated with MnO2 or MnOx in a sodium sulfate and a mixture of sodium sulfate and zinc sulfate electrolytes. So what they did, they use a uh, deconvolution of the impedance, uh, impedance spectroscopy, the, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this plot. In fact, you can consider that even for pseudo-capacitive or capacitive material, this is uh, all the plot is described by an impedance, which is associated with uh, capacitance. So Z is one, div uh, one divided by Jc omega. And then you end up with uh, real part of the capacitance, imaginary part of the capacitance. And they are interested in this. And you can plot 3D board uh, plots. And this is what you get. This is the carbon nanofiber in uh, sodium sulfate electrolyte. So there is no MnO2 on it. It's only a double layer. And what you see, this is the capacitance versus frequency at different potentials. And you see constant low value, constant value of capacitance is typical double layer capacitance. And now, if you plot the same for your carbon nanofiber coated with MnO2, thin layer of MnO2 in self sodium sulfate electrolyte, you see that you increase the capacitance and you have something which is rather constant here. It's a typical pseudo capacitive behavior. This 3D plot nicely shows that you have something which is rather constant depending on the potential and at the different frequencies. And if you use your material 
carbon nanofiber coated with MnO2 and zinc sulfate containing electrolyte. Then you move to a battery like behavior with changes of here the C prime with the potential. And this can be also uh, better shown if you have a look to the phase angle. And this is a paper that uh, Yuri Gugotsi published in Energy Storage Materials, where by tracking the uh, phase angle phi, you can really uh, have an idea of uh, the, uh, uh, the process you are currently observing. Minus 45 degree is diffusion limited, minus 90 degree is pseudo capacity or capacity light. So these uh, uh, 3D board plot analyses are very interesting and more and more popular. Okay, so this is a picture that we have double layer surface redox intercalation, and still this. A battery material at the extreme of the extreme part of a of a of a scheme, but I would say that the situation is maybe a bit more complex because what happens if you take a you start from a very uh, conventional battery material, two phase material, LiFePO4, and you prepare your material by creating some lot of defects. You can prepare iron free plus defective rich lithium FePO4 using the ultra centrifugation method. It's a work from uh, Katsuhiko now. What about the electrochemical performance of the defective LiFePO4? So this is a pristine LiFePO4, crystalline. So two-phase plateau in galvanostatic plot, no problem. This is a potential versus time at constant current, charge, discharge, constant two-phase plateau. This is now the electrochemical signature of your defective LFP with a small core of crystalline LFP. And as you can see, you move from a two-phase plateau to a very short plateau here at the same potential, which corresponds to the crystalline core of LFP. And here you have a very sloping profile corresponding to the, I would say, amorphous defective LiFePO4. So you completely change the electrochemical signature by creating some defects. And if you have a look, you compare the cyclic voltammetry, this is cyclic voltammetry of crystalline pristine LFP. And when you move to your defective LFP, you see that you have here these redox bumps at lower potential, which are typical from pseudo capacitive behavior. So it's a way, injecting some defects, it's a way to tune the performance of your material. And the, the power performance is greatly improved when you move, when you use your, I would say, uh, defective LFP. So other example that you can uh, that you can uh, you can have is uh, a TiU2B be and uh, uh, live free weight. But to try to understand that uh, why the, the influence of defect, there is a very interesting paper from Okubo, a seminal paper from Okubo. He took the LiCO2, which is a lithium ion battery cathode, not naturally, but it's a laminar oxide for lithium intercalation. You can intercalate lithium between the layer of CO2 and you play with uh, Li1 minus 6 LiCO2. When you use crystalline, crystalline LiCO2, you have a kind of plateau of a profile uh, for galvanostatic static plot. Why? Just because you have only one site energy epsilon s for the lithium intercalation it's a crystalline phase you have a constant interlayer spacing constant energy however when you nano size lico2 when you move to bulk like this one to 15 8 6 nanometer you can see that you transform the electrochemical signature from a plateau to a sloping profile typical from i would say uh, the same characteristic of the double layer and this is explained by the distribution of the surface of the site, sorry, energy, because of a surface defect. When you nano size, you have a lot of surface and surface is defect. So that you have a distribution of site energy for lithium ion intercalation and you have a sloping profile. And you completely change the electrochemical signature by surface defect. We see another example here. And finally, the conclusion and the message is what? If you have a look to these two plots, these are the same more or less, but don't get confused. You can take a battery material with very nice two-phase system and you can transform it into a sloping profile, but this is not the same, I will say. You cannot say it's pseudo-capacitive. Yeah, the signature is pseudo-capacitive, but I will say it's extrinsic pseudo-capacitance just because you modify, you create some defect onto your material. And this is also something that you have to, to not to get confused with. So this is just a nano-sizing, the defect, creation of defect 
which leads to this kind of signature. And now the last part of the talk will be to try to give you a, a view of what could be maybe a, a view of a pseudo capacity mecha mechanism. So this is a, oh, sorry. If you take a two nanometer per size carbon in a two, two mole per liter, EMI, TFSI, electrolyte. So it's a porous carbon with big, large pores. It's a macro mesoporous carbon. You have very nice uh, double layer signature, but we know from EQCM there is no ion dissolvation. So all the ions go in and out without dissolvation or partial dissolvation. Now, if you use one nanometer per size carbon in the same electrolyte at 100 millivolt, sorry, 100 millivolt per second, what you see is that on top of your conventional double layer here, uh, I'm not sure what you see my mouse, in fact. On top of a conventional double layer here, what you see is that you have these two redox bumps. And we know that from EQCM measurement, there is partial ion dissolvation in these one nanometer size carbon pores because these ions more or less have a dissolvation, uh, not more or less, from EQCM, they are some dissolvation. And these peaks, they contribute to increasing the capacitance. So if you analyze these peaks, you can plot the change of peak current versus the scan rate. You see that you have a kind of uh, a power which is very close to one. So it changes with the scan rate. So it's fully reversible from the electrochemical point of view. It's pseudo capacitive like because it changes with the, square, the potential scan rate. It's an additional capacitive storage and there is partial dissolution. So this could be, one way to see it, because there is no redox reaction from any other uh, source, one way to see it will be, since you partially dissolvate, the cation is closer or the ion is closer to the host, the carbon, and then you can make a partial, a little bit partial, a little partial charge transfer uh, from the ion to the carbon or to the carbon to, to, to the ion, just because you get the ion closer to a closer distance to the carbon. And now, if you take muxine moving from double layer and dissolvation to redox materials, muxines in non aqueous electrolyte. So, this is a work the, the, from, uh, done with uh, Yuri Gabotzi. You see that these are two TF3C2 muxine in three different electrolytes Li TFSI in acetonitrile, DMSO, PC. For DMSO and acetonitrile, there is a, I would say, poor, electro, not poor, but not that impressive electrochemical signature. For PC, you see, you open the electrochemical signature at low uh, potential for lithium intercalation. So you can get high capacity, and this is very counterintuitive selection of solvent because PC electrolyte has the lowest conductivity. So what happens in this electrolyte differently from DMSO and acetonitrile? First, what you can see is that the power performance of this material is still very high. The peak current is more or less follows the uh, potential scan rate. The impedance is typical from pseudo capacitance. So high power, pseudo capacitive behavior. And then if you have, uh, if you track the position of 002 peak by XRD, in situ XRD during cycling, what you see is that there is no change of the 002 peak position in the LITFSI PC electrolyte, constant more or less at 10.7 amps. However, in DMSO and acetonitrile electrolyte, there is a change of D. And if you do some modeling, the only way to try to end up with this kind of this value for the D spacing and no change is to have PC molecules which are not present around the lithium, which is in between the layers of the mixing. In other words, lithium is intercalated between the maxin layers with no or very few solvent molecules. Differently in acetonitron and DMSO, lithium was not dissolvated and could access the interlayer of mixins with solvent molecules. So finally, the lithium dissolvation in non aqueous electrolyte leads to also improved capacity. So we could see a kind of sketch where we have this kind of uh, 2D materials or a pore size, I would say. When you have pore size, which is, or 2D distance, uh, interlayer distance, which is large enough, where solvated ions can enter, 
For instance, you have conventional for pulse carbon, conventional electrochemical behavior, which is double layer. On the other hand, when you decrease the interlayer distance, or when you decrease the pore size, you can end up into a situation where the ion, the cation here, is fully dissolvated. And this is typically the case for lithium intercalation in graphite. Lithium intercalation in graphite, if you use, you cannot use PC because lithium goes dissolvated between the layers. And then you have a high capacity because of full dissolvation. If you, oops, if you take it from the redox point of view here, muxine in sodium sulfate shows a typical double layer behavior. There is no charge uh, redox reaction. There is no change of titanium oxidation state. It's fully only double layer, low capacity, double layer. However, when you put lithium into LiFePO4, lithium is dissolvated and you see that you have a strong uh, interactions between the, you have a strong, I would say, charge transfer because one, one lithium stands for one uh, electron, one Faraday, one mole of lithium is one Faraday. And now in between, you have these zones where in porous carbon, when you have this partial dissolution, you start to see this here redox bumps appearing that could be due to kind of partial charge transfer to the carbon. When you see, when you use muxines here, what you can see is that when you dissolvate the lithium between the layers, you open this kind of pseudo capacity behavior and you increase the charge to rate. So it could be maybe seen this zone between, I would say, adsorption electrostatic and full intercalation dissolvated could be where the pseudo capacitive material uh, will play by just, I would say, uh, considering that pseudo capacitance could be a kind of uh, uh, pseudo, uh, sorry, pseudo capacitance behavior, I'm a little bit tired, could be in fact interpreted as partial dissolvation uh, in between state between electrostatic and intercalation. So this is something we are currently uh, working on. And basically to conclude, I would say that from the carbon-based supercap, uh, increasing the energy density, there are different things that can be done. Uh, on uh, uh, the, the pool structure of the carbon is, uh, is very important, as I mentioned on the AQCM measurement, and there are a lot of work on uh, cleaning the edge of carbon structures, noble carbon from Antonietti and Kyotani uh, uh, for the edge, uh, Andrea Balucci on electrolyte, trying to develop uh, solid electrolyte, I would say passive layer, uh, artificial passive layer on, on pool carbon to increase energy in the voltage window. And also super cap, carbon super caps are very interesting still because they have high power, high cyclability. So uh, they, they, they will be a still used for a lot of applications. And mainly for batteries, I would say, uh, the idea is to increase uh, the power density because again, there is a, a big, big, big market which is approaching, which is replacement of lead acid batteries. Uh, you can do it by playing with electoral architectures. This is a paper from Bruce Dunn where you create some, uh, I would say, highly accessible pearl structures. I showed you that you can play with material structure by creating amorphous defective LFP, uh, extrinsic capacitance, but you can play also with intercalation pseudo capacitance with an IBM oxide, with muxines now in organic electrolyte, with W3, like this is the work of uh, Veronica Augustine's. Uh, and obviously, as I mentioned, Muxins in organic electrolyte. And uh, I gave you a lot of uh, uh, figures and image from this uh, very nice paper from uh, Volker Presser and Veronica Augustine and Simon Fleischmann, Kem Sokrev in uh, 2020. And the main message I will say is that uh, there are opportunities to develop fundamental approaches uh, shared by both technologies and, and the high power batteries and the pseudo capacity of super cap field, uh, to my opinion, is slowly merging and it's converging. And I believe that uh, in the next couple of years or maybe a few, few years from now, we will speak about high power uh, redox materials. But what is super interesting is to try again uh, to really understand from a fundamental point of view this, this uh, mechanism, uh, uh, pseudo capacitance mechanism concept. Okay, I would like to thank uh, all my colleagues from the lab, to thank also a special thank for, uh, to Yuri Gagossi, Bruce Dunn, Marcus Antoniti, Veronica, Augustine, Lindsay Fang, and Maya Laketskaya, uh, my colleagues. And I would like to thank you a lot for your attention. I realized that it was a long 
long talk. I apologize for that, uh, but I hope uh, that uh, it was not too boring. So thanks a lot, and I'm ready for questions if you have some. Thank you, Patrice. Yes, it was a long but really, really insightful talk. I think it's one probably of the most insightful talks on capacitors that I've ever heard of. Thanks a lot. Um, maybe I'll just take advantage of being an organizer and just ask the first question. Um, so whenever I look at these intercalated pseudocapacitors, for example, lithium, titanium, uh, del sulfide, um, I'm always wondering whether the solid state diffusion really plays any role in, in limiting the rate, because whenever people show that it looks like the, the, the results of, uh, um, yeah, the, the results of the intercalation, it looks like the lithium diffusion inside the solid material um, doesn't limit the um, charging rates. Oh, no, 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 no. If you, you um... Uh, or maybe I, maybe I, yeah, maybe yeah I mean, if you if you if you take the example of a very conventional LFP, mm -hmm. the uh, mechanism is uh, the kinetics is limited by lithium diffusion in the crystal structure of LFP. Obviously, LFP has a nice uh, has a nice uh, uh, free structure, tavoid structure, and so on. But 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 the diffusion coefficient is ten to minus twelve, ten to minus thirteen, just because this is solid state diffusion in the crystal structure of the LFP structure. And uh, the, the, the trick is to try to design the best, I would say, uh, the crystallographic structure where you have big channels and less interactions with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the, uh, I would say, transition metals and so on, where you can have a fast uh, diffusion. And one of the problem of NMC materials, uh, positive, uh, positive active materials, and nickel, manganese, cobalt, uh, nickel rich materials, is the cation mixing. As long as you have Nickel two plus, which are going moving to the tetrahedral sites of uh, uh, of uh, sorry uh, in between the layer and the lithium sites, then lithium diffusion is strongly affected, and then the power performance decreases a lot. So, solid state diffusion limits the uh, I would say the uh, the kinetics in these uh, in these materials. But you know, in these materials, this is fully desolvated as well. So this is why when you when you have a still partial uh, 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 partial dissolution, you can still have fast uh, transport, transfer, because for instance, muxin structure is rather flexible and and 205 structure is highly suited for, 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 for fast uh, trans lithium transport, but the penalty, the price to pay is to decrease, in fact, the capacity. Is that, is that okay? Uh, was, yeah, was, uh, but was would, would it be then uh, correct to say that uh, titanium S2 is just a very good conductor for lithium um, as a solid state conductor? Yeah, but you know, yeah, but you have uh, even more. You have uh, Li4 uh, lithium titanate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Li4 TFI sure. 12, which is even. Uh, but it's it, right, but it's not yeah. redox active, right? Oh, no, no, no. LTO, yes, it's redox active, definitely. Titanium uh, four, titanium three. Oh, LTO, okay, yeah, yeah. LTO, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, it's it, 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 it's correct. Anyway, you are limited by the uh, by the conductivity of lithium, in fact, by wow. the mobility diffusivity of lithium, definitely. It's not the lithium in, uh, in the liquid electrolyte which limits the performance, which is diffusion in solid state. Okay, maybe since you already mentioned the uh, dissolvation, maybe you can comment on the role of dissolvation, because usually whenever you have an ion transfer from the electrolyte into the electrode, dissolvation happens, of course, and that is essentially a kinetic barrier. So that should limit the rates because it translates into the rates. So is, is there anything um, yeah, that you can probably add here. Yeah, um, I would say that uh, it's a difficult question to address. It's because uh, I don't have a clear, clear idea why, for instance, uh, to show you back, I don't know why, for instance, yes, this figure here, I don't know why we don't see a lot of penalty to pay to this uh, partial dissolution. But the point is that uh, in this uh, highly porous 3D structure, it seems that dissolvation, it's not a full dissolvation, it's a partial dissolvation. Um, you, see the, you see the change of the peak current with, uh, with the potential scan rate is really close to one over a uh, few hundred of millivolts. So um, this, there, is a penalty, there is a price to pay, there is a penalty, definitely. But it, we, we, we did not see a huge polarization uh, what I mean by polarization, when you switch from charge to discharge, 
the, the kind of uh, uh, potential drop not linked with omit drop, but linked with electrochemical kinetics. We don't see that. We don't see a huge polarization when you uh, when you switch. So there are a lot of things to understand. So, um, to my opinion, we see, this is something which is still not clear, even uh, 15 years after the, the science paper, definitely. Great. Okay, so we have uh, <laughs> two more people. But you see, Andrew, questions. maybe maybe one way to do it would be to uh -huh. try to to integrate here to do some uh, temperature measurement and integrate the, to calculate the activation energy for the process here. That could be maybe. I'm, I'm, I guess the main, my, my main interest right now in here is whether there is some theory that could explain. I'm sure. The concept that could explain that um, the presence of solvation does not limit um, the rate. So th th there was a lot of work, uh, and uh, I'm thinking about uh, Alexei Kornichev as well uh, with his ionophobic poles. Uh, we did a lot of modeling onto these uh, onto materials. Um, so, but. but uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, useful, not useful uh, from the scientific point of view, I mean, in the practical point of view, obviously, because the potential you need to apply to, to, to see this phenomenon is five, 10 volts. So uh, um, what, 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 is, what is sure is that the diffusion coefficient of lithium inside the pores, of uh, sorry, cations of the ions inside the pores, even after the solvation, is obviously a little bit less than in bulk electrolyte, definitely but is not that strongly decreased compared to uh, what you could uh, expect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is it possible then, maybe, okay, one last question before I can see the audience is um, raising hands. So basically, is it possible that the, the, the gradual dissolution is the key? Sorry? The is it possible that the gradual, gradual dissolution, so the ion slowly loses its on um, solvation shell. That could be the key to minimize the um, um, the barrier. Yeah, or solvent reorganization. Maybe maybe uh, maybe solvent reorganization around the ions. You see, mm -hmm. uh, which finally will the, it will be the same. It uh, finally you will have less solvent molecules around the ion. Yeah, why not? That that, that could be. Yeah. All right. So now, um, anyone else has questions? Uh, hello. May I? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It was an absolutely fantastic talk. Uh, in, in Leipzig, we um, recently studied ion diffusion in carbon materials for supercaps. And uh, we found out a couple of very unexpected observations that diffusivity in hierarchical carbons can be as low as 10 to the minus uh, 13 uh, square meters per second. But uh, my question was, um, that's just to, su to support that statement. But my question was, uh, it is also known that uh, lithium diffusion has been successfully probed by the same technique, diffusion enema in zeolite materials. Uh, do you think that uh, such experiments on lithium uh, diffusion in these materials, especially the diffusion limited ones, would be helpful to quantify the diffusion limitations and possibly maybe even un un unravel the nature of diffusion limitations and how to optimize that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. You, you're absolutely right because all the expertise and experience which was gained uh, versus lithium could be uh, could be definitely uh, uh, could be definitely used for that. Yeah, you're, you're definitely right. This is a very good point. Yeah, I fully agree. All right, thank you. More questions? So, so may I now? Go ahead, yes. Uh, that was a really wonderful lecture from you. I think I had a wonderful opportunity hearing from you directly. So I think I wanted to know about, I think today you, I have not touched upon uh, the sodium intercalation for uh, batteries and uh, especially in that kind of redox activity. So how it will, how MXing can have a role in you no know, sodium and batteries and its future in intercalation and pseudo capacitance in that kind of uh, no performance in future because you no know, there is a talk between a shift in lithium ion to sodium ion batteries mm -hmm. with the availability and uh, market. Now, this is a very interesting question. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, for, for, for a long time, Maxine were really interesting and uh, really uh, 
uh, high perform, uh, did really perform well in aqueous electrolyte. And this is only recently that muxin start to be uh, really interesting in terms of capacity and kinetics in lithium ion containing electrolyte. So uh, it means that uh, we, we, I, I, I tried I tried to show you that uh, it was needed for that to make these uh, muxines operating from aqueous to non-aqueous electrolyte. It was not a copy and paste. We need to redesign, understand the surface termination and so on. So uh, for sodium, it's the same. Basically, I did what uh, any <laughs> I did what uh, everyone uh, should have done at my at that place when uh, when we did some um, molten salt muxine. Uh, we tested in lithium ion. Yes, it works. We tested in sodium ion. No. It was not good for sodium ion intercalation. So uh, yeah, definitely that would be great. And this is something we are currently investigating. Sodium ion intercalation in molten salt, I mean, in muxines with controlled surface termination groups, but it's not trivial. And this is why it's interesting uh, because sodium is, uh, is bigger. Sodium is, uh, is softer with acid and so on. So there are a lot of uh, things that uh, could explain why sodium does not behave like, like lithium, but yes, that will be, uh, this is interesting to try to, uh, to make muxine materials uh, operating, uh, uh, reaching high capacity and high power for sodium ion batteries, definitely. So it is a yes for, uh, that's a huge challenge and opportunity for us to work on uh, sodium ion intercalated MX materials for next generation batteries and super capacitors. Okay. So Thank next you. we can exchange on that, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. Thanks for your nice comments. Hello. Is it a good time to talk? To ask? Yes, go ahead. Ah, OK. OK. Um, this is Beatrice. Hello. Ah, hi, Beatrice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just uh, probably a, a phenomenon, maybe already known, or maybe uh, I just don't know the details. But you show several uh, CVs of Maxine's. Mm -hmm. And if you can maybe uh, shift to one of your slides where you show a Maxine working on uh, aqueous or organic electrolyte. Yeah. Just to, to, to explain what the question is about. Which one you want? I guess any in sulfuric might do. Sulfuric? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, I am working at the moment with several vaccines, and I and I see that in aqueous electrolytes, this shape of the of the um, of the CV is very characteristic. That nearby to the OCP, you don't really get too much um, storage. I mean, mm -hmm. if this has been correlated to the morphology, to the stoichiometry, or perhaps also to the electrolyte, the nature of the electrolyte, ion size. I think I think this depends. Um, I'm not sure that OCP is the right parameter to uh, to uh, take into consideration. I think that PCC is the most important point, and PCC depends on zeta potential and uh, isoelectric uh, point. So I think that uh, uh, um, everything is driven by the PCC and the zeta potential of the surf uh, muxine surface. So. Uh, uh, if you want to make a systematic study of what happens in sulfuric acid by changing the surface group, to my opinion, what would be great would be to measure the isoelectric point, I mean, the zeta potential and the isoelectric point of your, uh, of your maxine surface to try to make the correlation between the electrochemical performance and your surface termination groups in sulfuric acid. Okay, so, so, you, so you think it's, it's directly related to the yeah the charge on the surface? Much more, much more to the to the surf. I mean, in aqueous electrolyte, then we're talking. So in aqueous yeah. electrolyte, I'm, I'm, in aqueous electrolyte, there is one key point, which is the presence of intercal in of water intercalated between the mixing layers. If you remove by heat treatment, this paper we did last. Year, um, but by six months ago. If you remove by heat treatment the water between the mixing layers, then you kill the redox activity in aqueous electrolyte. So, so this is the first point. But if you don't uh, specifically want to, uh, if you don't uh, take actions to specifically remove by heat treatment this water intercalated, intercalated water, then uh, everything is driven by surface in uh, aqueous electrolyte. And then I believe again, uh, zeta potential and PCC. I see. Okay. And actually, this shape, I mean, it's not necessarily related to the same phenomenon, but I, I think um, I saw it also when you try with lithium in the molten material. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you see it as well, more or less. 
Yeah, this one? Yeah, that one, yeah. Sort of. <laughs> so so you, you, your question is? Yeah, yeah, if, if in this case, because it's a totally different system, will it be related mm -hmm. to the same phenomenon? Yeah, because here what we, uh, what we understood is that the key difference, fluorine, replacing fluorine with chlorine uh -huh. okay. as, a, as, a, as a great impact, definitely. But also something here is that you don't have any OH hydroxy termination groups. You have only oxygen and chlorine, no hydroxy. And it seems to be also the key for uh, huge, I mean, for better uh, electrochemical activity in, uh, in LP30. Yeah. Fluorine and no hydroxy. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if this will change over, over cycling. Like this will. So fast, so stable, cyclability is good because uh, um, I would say uh, titanium uh, chlorine uh, bonds are quite strong, differently from bromide or iodine. So this is, this is a very decent for, I mean, not for carbon uh, versus carbon base, but for versus uh, redox, uh, redox material. You can, you can run uh, thousands of cycles with, uh, with no capacity degradation, I would say. But obviously, uh, you know, it depends what you call cyclability. If you make a floating uh, really super slow scan rate for years, yeah, definitely we will see some, uh, some capacity loss. But, uh, if, you, if we benchmark to other materials we are used to, like NB205 and so on, this is a, no problem. Yeah, okay, okay. I mean, one point to solve is the first irreversible capacity for these materials. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks, Beatrice. Okay. And sorry for not uh, answering your, your, your email yet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, this is answered now. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Yeah, thanks. May I ask a question? Yep. Uh, thanks at first for the great talk. And uh, second, you mentioned today about conventional electrolyte, like uh, organic electrolyte, one, one molar ionic liquids. What do you think about quite new water and salt electrolytes, about practical uh, and at first about the, let's say, also dynamics in these uh, water and salt electrolytes? So uh, I will make a very brief answer. Uh, we have something uh, in revision regarding water in salt and Maxim together with uh, Yuri Gagotzi. Uh, finger crossed because, yeah, uh, <laughs> we select water in salt electrolyte are very, I'm not sure that it will make, uh, it will make a point for commercial uh, product and so on, but for, uh, I would say fundamental studies, that's, that's really interesting. And uh, so the answer of, to your question is yes, water and salt electrolyte for fundamental studies are very interesting for vaccines. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we will, <laughs> we will get our pa pa paper published, uh, but le let's see, <laughs> you know, good job. So I, sorry, I cannot say, say, say a bit more, but uh, yeah, uh, we select electrolyte is uh, are, are really interesting because you have a, you know, Solvation is di completely different. So this is a, this is a perfect uh, in-between case between, uh, as you mentioned, neat ionic liquid and uh, solvated, uh, solvated uh, salt, I would say. So it's, uh, you are very close to ionic liquid, but still you have some solvent. So there are very nice fundamental studies to do with it. Yeah, Fully uh, very, very good remark. Thanks. Did I understand right that also solvation, dissolvation depends on the conductivity of the solution or not? Uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it depends on the conductivity. The point is that uh, you need to adapt the, the kinetics, I mean, your, your, your scan rate and so on uh, to, to the conducti conductivity of your electrolyte. Yeah. I think it depends, uh, it depends more between the interactions of the solvation energy of, uh, of, of, of the ions and uh, I mean, the interactions between the solvent molecules and your cation and anions. And also uh, from the host, because uh, obviously a graphite, a graphite material has not the same uh, interactions with uh, propylene carbonate as a muxine surface as, so uh, it's, uh, I would say salt solvent interaction and solvent host matrix interaction. Thanks for the answer. Thanks a lot. Uh, so may I ask questions? Uh, yes. 
sir it was a, a nice talk thanks thank you so and sir for, uh, my first question is so is there any reports of uh, electronic conductivity of uh, uh, fluoride free amexins uh no uh let me i, I don't remember there, there was a science paper last july uh or august i don't remember if they did some uh, electronic conductivity measurement uh but no no i'm not sure no no you're right okay sir and then sir uh, one more question so uh, uh, perovskite materials are also they have shown uh, some intercalation pseudo capacitance so means uh, how can we differ that kind of uh, intercalation pseudo capacitance with other uh, nb2o5 like so what is the main mechanism yeah mechanism is more or less the same as long as this is more with anion it was a paper published uh, 2015 yeah 2015 yeah yeah sure sure so uh, it fits uh, it fits nicely with uh, with uh, i would say uh, within the sketch i presented yeah you are right that you not mention about uh, uh, perovskites but uh, yeah sorry i could not uh, talk about everything because it was a bit uh, one hour and a half uh, <laughs> But it fits in the scheme, no problem. The only the only uh, difference is that this is a uh, oxygen driven. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay. Maybe we can um, see if, if there is any more questions. So we have a uh, maybe one more question. If uh, the audience is still okay. If not, then maybe um, we should think. Okay. Sorry. Can I? Yes. Can I, if the time permits? Sorry. Hello, sir. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Thanks, I have a curiosity regarding uh, solid-state electrolytes, particularly uh, the lithium-ion and sodium-ion conductors. Um, so where? So you see, even there is a lot of uh, resistance for the ion flow. Even then, solid-state batteries are much promising. So, can you show some light on solid-state ion conductors? Can I show? Sorry. Can you just brief out something yeah. about solid-state ion conductors? Uh, uh, solid-state ion batteries. Uh, well, there are several things to 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 comment on. First, what do you call solid-state battery? Because there is one solid-state battery which is a uh, sulfur. Or oxide, uh, oxide using oxide or sulfur, uh, fully solid electrolyte, and then you have a lot of a lot of uh, solid-like state batteries using uh, hybrid polymers and blah 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 and so on. Uh, so uh, first, we need to, to to define what we are talking about. It's like a thermal engine and thermal vehicle and a full electric vehicle. In between, we have the hybrid vehicles, and you have a lot of uh, solid state, which are a lot of devices which are which are called solid state batteries, which are not solid solid state. In fact, it's a gel, it's a hybrid polymer plus solvent, polymer plus filters plus solvent, and so on. So, if we talk about oxide (LLZO), for instance, garnets and sulfur. Uh, it's going to be tricky. Uh, it's super challenging because uh, so far, uh, uh, yes, there are some, uh, you know, this LGPS phases from Cano, which have a very high conductivity, uh, like uh, liquid uh, liquid electrolyte. But uh, when you when you need to to design your electrolyte and to measure the conductivity with the grain boundaries and so on, the conductivity decreases first. Yes. Second, none of these electrolytes are stable at uh, at the operating potential of a cathode. Yes, exactly. Uh, or or the anode, except LLZO. But LLZO, if you put lithium in front of LLZO, you have an incompatible interface. You need to have a lithophilic interface so that uh, the interface issue is not solved yet. So uh, uh, with sulfur, most of the sulfur, they are thermodynamically unstable in contact of NMC or lithium metal. It's just yes. stability by, I would say, uh, uh, reactions, uh, passivation. Then you have also the problem of uh, uh, space charge uh, region in uh, when you put sulfur electrolyte in, in contact with NMC material. So yes. my main message is that a real true solid state battery 
It's super challenging. Not sure we will arrive, we will succeed because also you have volume change and uh, there are lifting yes, edge rates, yes. even uh, with garnet and sulfur. But it's really worth to try because this is one of today one of the one of the only way to reach 500 watt hour per kilogram. So this is why a lot of efforts are put, put like that. And, and this is really interesting, but I will see the difficulty is to master the interfaces because all the interfaces, electrolyte positive, electrolyte lithium metal are really, really tricky to, uh, to tune. Yes, yes. So why I'm interested in this particular solid state electrolyte is, uh, see in lithium sulfur batteries, the major issue is with the dissolution of polysulfide in the liquid electrolyte. Um, I'm, so I'm that's sorry, where the transformation we, has been. Um, maybe we can leave these topics to the yes. speaker who will be an expert in, in solid state batteries yeah. um, in the future. I think that at this point, okay. um, my suggestion would be to um, uh, maybe let our speaker take a rest and um, <laughs> Um, just for all of us to say thank you because it was a really uh, long and really yeah sorry uh, <laughs> thank you thank you very much sorry sorry because I was a bit long uh, I apologize uh, um, okay so with that uh, uh, thank you so much Patrice it was a really really long talk and really long discussion it was very helpful I think for all of us um, and I'm sure many people will also. Um, look at um, or watch this um, um, colloquium in the future. So um, thank you so much and uh, have a nice evening. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.